<coughs> Welcome again to the second sessions of our conference today. After the coffee break, I hope everyone is refreshed and ready for our very interesting discussion in this panel. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce you our first panelist, Mr. Sorry. <laughs> Our first panelist is Andrew Maston. He is currently a lecturer in law at Asapshan University. Uh, the subjects he teaches including international law, business law, <laughs> diplomacy, American law, legal research and writing. He also works extensively as a business lawyer while he was doing his career in, in the United States. He graduated from Boat Hall School of Law, University of California, with a JD degree from Berkeley, and a BA in English and Literature from Harvard University. Now, our second panelist, Ajahn Sakda, Professor Sakda Thanitgun. He is a professor of law from Jalalongkorn University. He also holds an LRB from an LLM and LRD in international law from Tokyo University, Japan, and also an LLM and PhD in ASEAN comparative law from University of Washington, United States. Ajahn Sakda was a member of the advisory team of the chief negotiation in Japan, Thailand, FTA negotiation during 2003 and 2004, as well as a member of the advisory team of the chief negotiator in the United States, Thailand, FTA negotiation during the 2004 <coughs> and 2005. He has been a member of Trade Competition Commission of the Thai Ministry of Commerce and was a visiting professor at the Faculty of Law, University of Hanover during March and May 2006. Now on to our moderator, I give you Ajahn Prapit Chat Prapachai Nakha. He will be your moderator for the sessions. He graduates from Cornell Law School and also currently a PhD candidate here in at Nidaha. Distinguished guest, panelist, I give you the discussion floor. Okay, good morning, um, every audience, and <coughs> thank you, Nida, for giving us an opportunity, and it is, we affirm that it is our great honor to be invited as a panelist today. So, we would like, um, actually, we would like to make this discussion a purely panelist. So, we, we um, it is more likely a, a, a coffee break, a coffee break speaking. <laughs> yeah, more likely a coffee break speaking. And you guys are welcome to participate anytime. I mean, you can raise the question anytime. You please feel free to interrupt us and feel free to join the coffee break yeah, <laughs> as a panelist. So, okay, so according to the topic that are assigned to us, we need to talk about legal consideration for ASEAN free trade agreement. But please, everyone, please be prepared to listen other subjects that are not directly related to the topic. All right, so that, yeah, I know that uh, many people here are waiting for the right topic for your work. <laughs> So, and we are willing to help. Okay. Um, let's begin with Ajahn Sakta. Would you please describe in general about what ASEAN Free Trade Agreement is and what, what is it? The most simple question. Well, ASEAN AEC is one of the objective of the so-called the big picture of ASEAN community. Uh, and we talk about ASEAN economic community. The basic idea is just like Ambassador Tane just mentioned. The aim of ASEAN is unlike EU. We are aimed at only free trade area, meaning that no tariff between member states. But the EU, they went deeper in terms of economic integration because they went deeper into custom union and into single market. So it's 
a lot deeper than ASEAN. Okay. One thing that I would like to point out is uh, it would be another perspective from Ambassador Tanet because he mentioned about, you know, he emphasized uh, on free trade earlier. But for me, I think the AEC, one of the most of very important objective is to become the free trade area, that's one. And the second one is to become the single production base for the big national corporations. Why they have to do that? Because if they do, don't do that, the FDI would go to China, most of them. So they need to compete with China. And I would argue, you know, uh, Ajahn Eng is here, I would argue that the Japanese TNC took advantage of this policy a lot. <laughs> and you will see in this newspaper, uh, it is Kung Tep Tulikit, just only last week, the top executive of Japanese company, uh, the one next, and the one who sits here is Prime Minister Payut, Sit next to him is Kyoichi Tanaka of Toyota Corporation. And after that, it will be the president of the Isuzu company, and then uh, Nissan, and can then you, Can Honda. you show it to me as well? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. And in the second page, you will see the detail in Kuntep Turkey. So the room, the reception room is the most uh, the most impressive room. So they are very important guests. The one who took those four CEOs, top executive, to meet with the Prime Minister is Permanent Secretary of Commerce, Kun uh, Chutima. So what I'm saying here is that because Japanese investment is so important, because AEC want to become the single production base, and the Japanese are here. And of course, one of the issues, because Japanese, they would have the so-called, the surface talk. But the deep inside is, it would relate to the doctor topic that will be one of the good topics for you in the future, is the TPP. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Japanese want to ask, how about, you know, the general question is, what is the incentive that the Thai government would provide for us? If we are going to move from the standard car into the high-tech one, for example, from the, the, the automobile that use gasoline or diesel, we move up into, you know, hybrid, and then we move into electric. What would be the incentive you would provide for us and make sure that, and make we feel that we would like to expand our investment here in Thailand? That's the first one. And the deepest one is, what is the TPP? Would you join? And how about your policy on automobile? Mm. Because deep inside, Japanese uh, automobile industry now is afraid of the Korean. In the past, you know, uh, it would be very difficult for the Korean electronic to compete with Japanese Sony, Toshiba. But now you can see that Korean Samsung surpassed Japanese electronic. In the past, Japanese automobile industry are not afraid of Korean car, but now they have to be afraid of Korean car. That's why if the automobile, you know, tariff rate on parts get reduced, it would mean that the Korean car would have more opportunity to come here into Thailand and compete with Japanese car too. So it's really difficult, you know, for Japanese, we want secure, we want you to protect us, but at the same time, they want Thailand to join TPP because they can export more. So it's very really complicated. That's why you would need the top executive to meet with the prime minister, with the permanent secretary there. That's the way I read the meeting, which is very important. I can just comment on that for a moment to say that the original momentum that started the wave of free trade agreements, these regional trade agreements, originally was mostly focused on uh, economic coordination, uh, economic development, trying to develop the domestic economies of the states that joined the free trade agreements. But as they became more sophisticated, there became an increasing emphasis on 
uh, foreign investment and trying to attract foreign investment. And so a lot of the terms of some of the later free trade agreements focus not only on economic integration, but also on changing investment rules and investment laws. And one of the most controversial mm -hmm. aspects of the TPP itself are the investor protection rules. Uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of where we are in the discussion, but I'm sure we'll go into it a little bit later on, uh, what the controversies are involving some of these rules that have been incorporated into the agreements with an eye to encouraging more foreign investment, mm. promoting the economic growth and development of the signatory states, but at potentially risk of some of the sovereign lawmaking authority of the member parties. Uh, if they are too kind and too friendly to foreign investors, they run the risk of losing their own ability to regulate the activity of foreign corporations that are doing business in their economic zone. Okay, so since there are like almost half of the ASEAN country uh, join TPP or has a well, strong four. ambition, four. okay, for, for uh, has a strong ambition to join, TPP, what are the U.S. aspects toward TPP from both government, uh, from big business, and from individuals? Maybe Professor Andrew, you could explain. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to turn attention to each one of those in turn. Uh, once the United States entered into the TPP discussions, which were not originally uh, initiated by the U.S. itself, but they became integrally involved, and then they, once they were there at the table, they really began to drive the agenda and dictate the sorts of terms that they wanted to see in the agreement. And initially for even professors like myself, for people in the media, there was a lot of confusion, if not just mystery, because nobody really knew what the TTP was about. The U.S. trade official and their administration were very, very closed mouthed about what was going on. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that the previous major effort that had been undertaken to negotiate an additional free trade agreement, sort of building on top of NAFTA, was the uh, CAFTA, so called, the Central American Free Trade Agreement with uh, Latin American countries in the United States. And they started off with some degree of secrecy, but eventually made the drafts public, and there was so much pushback. The drafts were so unpopular that in the end, the deal never happened. And I think the current administration of the United States took the view that if they could keep the deal quiet, negotiate it in private until it was largely finished, it would be much easier to get it over the finish line from announcement to ratification in a short period of time as sort of a fait accompli. It's all done. Here's the selling points. We've adopted plenty of trade agreements in the past, and so we should do this one as well. This was the overarching strategy, if you will, of the Obama administration, trying to control the narrative about what this was, what was going on. What happened, because you asked about, well, what is the public view? The administration's view is that this was just a logical next step, that we've got NAFTA, we've got other trade agreements, and we need to solidify our position in Asia to give us an anchor against Chinese influence, <laughs> that if this is an argument that the administration <laughs> openly made, that we need to make the rules on trade in Asia before China does. Yeah. So if someone's going to declare what the trade policies yeah. ought to be, we need to be out front. So we're going to get this agreement on the books and try and create the ground rules before China has a chance to change the picture yeah, on the ground. Uh, well, while they were attempting to do that, the negotiations dragged, and it went on for six, seven years. Right. And they lost control of the media narrative in the United States because more and more voices spoke up saying, why is it secret? What are they hiding? Mm -hmm. There must be something in there they know we're not going to like. Mm -hmm. And so the ground was sort of sown for a negative opinion, a negative public view of the treaty that it's so secretive it must be harmful to the general public or they would let us know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The only people who are given knowledge are the big corporations. <laughs> Everyone knew Westinghouse and General Electric and 
Halliburton and other major government contractors were represented at the negotiations. The major pharmaceutical industries, the representatives of pharma, the trade industry groups supporting uh, brand name prescription drug makers, they were participating in drafting. Why wasn't any public representatives allowed to see the drafts? Why didn't they have a voice at the table? So people were already biased to think that this must be a sweetheart deal for limited benefits to the already wealthy and successful multinational corporations. They're hiding all the negative uh, side effects for labor, for consumers, for less competitive businesses. Uh, and sure enough, when early drafts eventually were leaked, uh, WikiLeaks got a hold of some early versions of some of the more controversial provisions. And this really caused a little bit of a media storm in the US that I, I don't regularly have access to US <laughs> media markets living in Thailand, but I certainly follow the news and I follow internet commentary on the news. And the running narrative everywhere you looked was the TPP is a bad deal for American citizens. It's a great deal for multinational corporations. And when the first provision to be leaked out was the SIDS provisions, the investor protection scheme, if you will, that guaranteed that multinational corporations that invested in a particular country that would be a signatory to the TPP could argue they had lost potential profits, not even actual income, but expected profits. I built my factories in Singapore expecting that these were going to be the terms. Now they've been changed, so I should be compensated. And this caused a fairly significant backlash among the average voter, the average citizen in the United States. And so what you ended up with was a rather unusual situation in American politics where the elected president, uh, who's a member of one of the two major US political parties, the Democratic Party, was the primary supporter, negotiator of the TPP, and he had no support from his own political party. The rank and file members of the Democratic Party, almost without exception, opposed the TPP, and he had to rely on the votes of the opposition party to get the authority to sign it. And this is what he did. The Republican Party has always been pro-trade. It's part of their basic political platform. They favor trade agreements. They're open. Traditionally, this was bipartisan. The Democrats also, the Democratic Party was the one who brought us NAFTA. They negotiated <laughs> it. They signed it. And it cost them politically in the United States. People hold it against them. And so the Democratic Party turned 180 degrees and became a protectionist party against further liberalization of trade. So in the US legislature, the president's own party opposed his trade agreement. And it's odd because if you follow anything at all about US politics, you might have seen that the opposition party has opposed everything that this president has done. Even when he proposed their own ideas, they would vote against them. The health care <laughs> law famously was a Republican proposal. It came from Republican-oriented conservative groups as to how to reform health care. But when Obama made it his program, all those groups rejected it. Because it's Obama's idea, we cannot support it. And so the TPP, strangely enough, was the one time they were willing to break this tradition of we stand against everything the president stands for, and the Republicans came out supporting the TPP until the election started. Yeah. When the campaign began, <laughs> the candidates quickly discovered that anybody who was taking a pro-trade uh, stance was getting hammered by the voters. This was not a popular <laughs> political position to be taking. And uh, some of them, Hillary Clinton uh, for the Democrats, came out originally in favor. Of, she was involved in negotiating. <laughs> she was Secretary of State while it was under negotiation. So she was a part architect. But now she says she's against it and won't <laughs> sign it because she was losing lots of votes to her competitor for the Democratic nomination. Bernie Sanders, a senator, has been against, he, was a, he voted against NAFTA. He voted against authorizing the TPP negotiations. So he's clear in his history, he can come out and say, I've always been against free trade. And this was a winning argument for him in many especially labor-intensive states in America that have heavy industry. 
he was able to make this a winning theme. And to compete with this, Hillary had to do a 180 and say, oh, I no longer support the TPP. I'm listening to you guys, and I, I hear your complaints. So I'm going to back away. Her opposition is much more nuanced. She doesn't just say, it's a bad deal. We should scrap it. That's what most of them do say now. But she's taking the position that it should be renegotiated, reopened, and some of the terms modified. So it's a lot just to throw it all out, which is what everyone except for one are now saying. We're down to five contenders. And on the Republican side, we have one everyone knows about, Donald Trump, who is a firebrand protectionist. America's getting our pockets picked, he always says. We're losing all this trade to China. The, deal, the deals we negotiated are terrible deals that leave us being cheated by everyone else. And TPP is just another example where, even though it doesn't involve China, the terms are set up. You look at the origin rule. The origin rule only requires 40% domestic content. So 60% can be Chinese. The Chinese will just mass export their raw materials and their uh, finished subparts. These will be incorporated into all the materials under the TPP and then sold into the US without any tariffs. And China will just continue to eat the US's lunch. So this is his argument against TPP. Uh, Sanders' opposition is much more focused on not business, but labor. That this is a bad deal for business workers who will lose their jobs, and there's no provisions in it to compensate them. All the compensation runs to the wealthy, not to the poor. The compensation is all designed to make corporations whole. But what about the displaced workers? There's nothing for them. Uh, we have Ted Cruz on the Republican side, who also opposes TPP, says he's always been against it. but it's not quite true. He's often referred to by Mr. Trump as lying Ted, lying Ted Cruz, because in fact he voted in favor of the TPP authorization in the Senate. So again, he only changed his position when he discovered it was politically damaging. It's politically harmful in the US right now to be pro-TPP, so he flipped and said, no, now I'm against it. <laughs> and the only other one I haven't mentioned, because he's running last of all the remaining candidates, is John Kasich. But he's unique in that he's still a strong TPP supporter. He voted for NAFTA when he was in the legislature. He supports the TPP, and he says that it is crucial. It is absolutely imperative to maintain American competitiveness mm. that we I stay see. ahead of free trade. I see. So he thinks that we're all missing the big picture. Mm. The voters who are thinking, oh, it's bad for work, labor. Mm. It causes economic dislocation. More jobs will leave America. Mm that that isn't really the point. Mm -hmm. The point is if you don't do this deal, there won't right. be markets for our own goods. Right. We could save all the jobs we want, but they won't have any market to sell their <laughs> products. So you're cutting off your nose to spite <laughs> your face if you don't join <laughs> further liberalization efforts right. because the markets will end up being closed <laughs> to you. So you don't save jobs even by not joining. <laughs> so. OK, so thanks, Andrew, for letting us know that for letting us know that TPP is not only um, a dispute in Thailand, but in US as well. <coughs> and thanks, Nida, for conducting a conference he here mm -hmm. so that we don't need to pay the ticket to go to Harvard Law School. <laughs> OK, and um, Professor Sakda, looks like you have something to mention. Yes. Well, it is very really nice to listen to uh, Ajahn Andrew because his perspective is something that you know the Thai don't know. Now, I would like to tell you about, you know, the audience too, your good self too, about our perspective on the TPP. First of all, for the objective of this discussion, uh, I would like to uh, say something important for the students who are looking for the topics. Uh, Ambassador Tane talking about the free trade earlier, that is very important. But when you talk about FTA today, we are not talking about trade in goods. We are talking about trade in service. We are talking about investment. We are talking about the so-called non-conventional topic like labor and environment. Mm -hmm. And also, when, when you look at the TPP, as uh, Ajahn Andrew mentioned, it's very difficult to find the TPP. Luckily, I know that how can I access to the TPP via my Japanese colleague? He said that even to take a look, 
you better look at the official website of the New Zealand government, <laughs> and that's the way I can get access to the TPP. <laughs> Very interesting. Anyway, when we talk about the TPP, we are talking about 30 chapters. And each chapter, you know, it can make you a really good PhD thesis. For example, if you talk about labor chapter in the TPP, that is going to be uh, one of the, you know, the PhD thesis, and you have 30 chapters. Uh, it depends on uh, what topic that you are interested in. Because from legal perspective, you know, each chapter can be a good topic. And inside one chapter, like chapter on investment, they talk about Ajahn and Du talking about state invest, uh, investor and state dispute settlement. It's a clause in there that is good enough for the PhD topics. Uh, that is the, the topic. Now, as Ajahn and Du mentioned, the Basically, when we talk about the, the U.S. delegate who really, you know, uh, have a big say in the TPP, uh, but Andrew mentioned about the, the big TNC, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, GM, whatever. Now, the issue for the Thai concern is basically from the motto for the Thai who oppose TPP would be if Thailand accede to the TPP, the first thing is the drug, I mean medication, would get more expensive. And we cannot tolerate that because we, are, we don't have that much income to buy drug from the big pharma, you know, Pfizer, uh, Abbott, uh, Merck. Yeah. Let me just interject there for a second to say that as someone who's filed the WTO throughout my career, I am very proud of Thailand. I have great respect for the fact that Thailand is one of the only countries that's had the nerve to stand up and invoke the licensing provisions to make off-patent drugs, generic versions, when the patent version is extremely expensive. This provision exists and hardly any country has ever dared take on the drug industry and use it. And so when, Thai when the GPO started producing uh, generic versions of highly expensive AIDS drugs and heart drugs and anti-cancer drugs. I was all for that and I wonder why more countries haven't invoked the privilege of genericizing drugs that are still on patent but that are highly expensive such that their own citizens cannot afford those treatments. Thank you, Ajahn Indu, for mentioning about the compulsory licensing. Some of you may not know, in the year 2006, the Ministry of Public Health, Kasuang uh, Sanasuk, they used the so-called compulsory licensing in Thai Vikon, Karmakap Chai City Bat, because the big drug company, we are talking about Abbott, at that time produced Keleta, which is the, the HIV resistant, the very advanced drug. One tablet would cost the patient 90 baht. And those poor patients, they cannot afford to buy that for sure. And under the Thai universal healthcare system, the medical doctor in the state hospital support to keep them free of charge. And of course, Thailand is not that rich country. We don't have enough budget. That's why uh, the Minister of Public Health, they imposed three compulsory licensing at that time on HIV, two of them, for effivalence and Keleta. And then another one for chronic disease. They have very big nerve, uh, you know, imposed on chronic disease, that is the heart disease. Uh, Pravig is the drug made by the French Sanofi Adventist. Now, under the Thai perspective, Ajahn Andrew, if we access to the TPP, the NGO, they would say, see, if you sign it, compulsory would be very difficult. Not possible, but it's going to be very difficult to use compulsory. And of course, if you go against the United States big company, right. drug company, under the TPP, that the dispute settlement is enforced by the U.S. government. I don't think you can use compulsory yes. licensing after you join. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the time that Thailand invoked the compulsory licensing provision, the big pharmaceutical companies that were affected by it threatened to go to the WTO and take action. Not surprisingly to me, they never did so. 
because the rules were clearly against them. It was just a bluff. They were trying to threaten Thailand so they would back down. Uh, I, my attitude was, go ahead and sue. Go ahead and try, because in fact, this is well within the provision. This clearly qualifies for compulsory licensing under these circumstances, and not surprisingly, no suit was ever filed. But the rules under the TPP would, as Ajahn Sakta suggests, make it much more difficult. They are much more restrictive, and in fact, they have the effect of extending patent life beyond even what's currently practiced in the United States. So many people view this as a big birthday present for big pharmacy that uh, I didn't mention it before when I just summarized the political views of TPP, but most of the top line economists in the US have come out against TPP on economic reasons saying that the economic benefits just aren't there to justify all these other provisions. So that where's the sweetener isn't good enough to justify the bitter aftertaste of all these licensing provisions and uh, investor protection schemes and so on. So you've got some Nobel Prize winners right. like uh, Joseph Stieglitz, mm -hmm. um, Paul Krugman, there are plenty of others. Uh, I want to just do some name dropping. I, Jeffrey Sachs, Robert Reich, who was in the Clinton administration, uh, Adam Hirsch, Noam Chomsky, yeah. have all come out publicly saying that this is a Trojan horse, that it's not really a true trade agreement at all, that the provisions designed to lower the tariffs are just a distraction. They're sort of the bait to get people interested in joining the TPP, but once they do, they will find that their own domestic laws on labor protection environmental protection, which you mentioned, and intellectual property are going to be turned upside down by the pro-industry, pro-corporation provisions in the TPP. I hadn't mentioned environmental law yet, but that's another major concern that opponents of the TPP have voiced, that this stands to weaken the laws in the states that are already more protective of the environment, that there's a leveling effect built into the rules that rather than forcing all of the signatory states to bring their standards up to the highest standard of any of the signatory countries, mm -hmm. the effect would be rather to meet in the middle and drag worker safety protections, labor laws, and environmental laws down in the countries that currently provide more protection. Yeah, actually, I really love the word, the metaphor of Trojan horse is, uh, <laughs> is can describe loss of trade agreement that exists in Thailand right now and in other country. Uh, okay, so it looks like, actually as far as most uh, trade lawyers know, WTO and GATT is the core, is the general rule that are created to, uh, to, benefit, uh, to benefit us all. And it treat, it legally treat the FTA, as, um, such as TPP, ASEAN FTA, FTA, as an exception. Mm -hmm. But it's become trendy right now that this exception will become the general rule. What do you think about it? Um, let's start with Professor Andrew. Okay, well, let me start by giving you the legal foundation since our official title for our discussion today are the legal perspectives on the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. The legal basis within the WTO structure, the architecture of the trade agreements at the WTO, uh, exists in GATT and in GATS. In GATT you find Article 24, which indeed authorizes WTO members to enter separately into regional customs unions or regional free trade agreements recognizing that this is effectively an exception to the general WTO policy because the overall goal of the WTO is to create uniform trade rules that apply equally to all WTO members without any discrimination between trading partners. So if you're creating a little club within the WTO that gets better deals, that clearly conflicts with the anti-discrimination rules. So the express justification in Article 24 itself of GATT, the justification for allowing 
these discriminatory trade deals is that this promotes economic development. That the ultimate goal of the WTO was to promote trade, yes, but primarily to promote the economic development of each of its member countries. And since there are clear benefits to be received from countries who join free trade agreements for their own economic development and their uh, economic coordination with neighboring countries, we're going to allow these carve-outs, these regional deals that don't apply to everyone. But there are two stipulations. In GATT, it says that to be authorized, a free trade agreement must not increase barriers for non-members. So if you're not a signatory to the free trade agreement, you can't be disadvantaged. You obviously don't get the benefits. You're not allowed to trade without any tariffs the way that the internal parties are, but it's okay as long as they don't actually increase the obstacles to trade for non-member countries. And there is a further provision in GATS when we're talking about services. It has the same language about not increasing tariffs or trade barriers on non-signatories, but it also has two additional provisions, one of which says that it's only to be permitted if the labor rules apply broadly to all sectors. So it's not allowed to target construction or shipping or fishing or any other particular industry to liberalize trade rules only in services in that area. It needs to be broadly across all categories. And the second requirement is that the liberalization must Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. It must serve to eliminate all existing discriminatory measures mm -hmm. between the parties who sign the free trade agreement. So you can't have half measures. Under the WTO rules, under GATS, you're not allowed to just get rid of some restrictions on migratory labor, but if you've got those restrictions and you want to sign a free trade agreement, you can only do it if you eliminate all barriers. So no half measures and no targeted right. solutions. It has to be truly broad in its application. This is what GATT says. The problem with all this, as these rules were created, there were very few free trade agreements in existence. And as Ajahn Tanet highlighted, there has since been an enormous proliferation of these agreements. It's true today that virtually every one <laughs> of the 191 <laughs> members of the WTO is a signatory to at least one, but in many cases, more than one free trade agreement. Sometimes there are five or six different overlapping agreements. And so it's really served to defeat one of the principal goals of the WTO, which was to create uniform rules. And instead we have a variation on the problem that existed before GATT was brought into being, which was we had all kinds of bilateral trade agreements with mm. unique conditions for every trading partner. Comparative so no advantage theory, mm. right? Comparative advantage yes. theory. Uh, you said we are moving uh, far away from this, from this theory? I wouldn't, be, oh, I wouldn't say that. I'm saying we're moving away from the WTO goal of uniformity. Mm. The, they wanted to replace this random web of overlapping bilateral agreements with a single overarching mm. sphere of uniform trade laws that applied equally to all WTO. This was the great incentive to get countries to join the WTO, is that now any offer made from one country to another will automatically be extended to the entire membership. We're going to take the idea of most favored nation and we're going to apply it universally. The problem is that this is defeated by localized <laughs> FTAs where we're not in fact offering our best terms to everyone, but only to the members of our particular club. And so there's a clear tension, a clear conflict in principles between FTAs and the general WTO program, which has never been resolved. In the Doha agenda, if you're familiar with developments at the WTO, there was a major attempt to revamp the WTO agenda in 2001, and they created the Doha Development Agenda that set a series of goals. And one of the goals at that time was, let's try and figure out this problem with free trade agreements, what to do about it. Because it, it so happens that there is a committee within the WTO tasked with reviewing 
and passing judgment mm -hmm. on whether FTAs comply with the requirements of Article 24 of GATT and Article 5 of GATT. The problem is that like all committees within the WTO, they rely on consensus. Mm -hmm. All the members of the committee have to agree. And since some of the members no. on the committee are in the FTA and some of them are not, <laughs> they have not achieved consensus. And since the WTO was created, in 1995, there have been exactly zero rulings issued by the Committee on Free Trade Agreements <laughs> to say whether or not any particular trade agreement AFTA included. The EU included. They've never ruled whether these, in fact, comply with WTO requirements or contradict them. So it is simply a gray area that is unresolved because they cannot achieve consensus. And let me throw it back to you for a minute to say, what about that same problem in AFTA? What about the consensus trouble with disputes that arise under AFTA? <laughs> okay, so Professor Sakda, what do you think about this type of distortion between, between uh, principle and exception? Okay, actually I have three things. First one, for the dispute settlement mechanism, actually uh, Ambassador Tenet is his expert. Uh -huh. uh, Basically, what it means is because of, unlike the WTO, the AEC uh, dispute settlement mechanism, the ASEAN dispute me mechanism, is not mandatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is one of the main points. So, Ambassador Tanen, not his head, mean that my answer is okay. <laughs> yeah. The second one is, I would like to point out about the TPP, because that is a very big issue for Thailand, is for the farmer. Remember, in the U.S., you have 2% of population that can produce food and feed American people, plus the fact that the, the American is the top exporter of food. But in Thailand, we have 40% of the labor force engaged in agriculture. Now, the one who opposes the TPP, they can find the motto very powerful. If we join the T uh, TPP, it would mean that the farmer in Thailand, they have to buy seed from Monsanto. Mm -hmm. And they can use only once. And they have to keep buying. It would mean that it would be the big loss to the farmer. And remember, 40% of the labor force is big, especially when it comes to election. That is very powerful, yes. both politically and economically. And that one is one of the thorny issues that we cannot succeed in negotiating with the U.S. Thailand FTA. Mm -hmm. Now come back to uh, Ajahn Prapuk's uh, uh, question about the free trade and the WTO. Now let me put it very simple. WTO is multilateral trading system, and it is supposed to be good for everyone. As Ajahn Andrews mentioned that, you know, because WTO tried to build a uniform rule for everyone. Imagine something very close to ourselves. In 18, 1855, the British came here with the gunboat, and as the Thai signed the, uh, basically the, the, the treaty with the British. And if you don't sign, we're going to bomb your palace. Mm -hmm. So Thailand need to sign. One of the very short cross, but very important, is that the Thai government could not impose more than 5% at volatile tax, 3% uh, at volatile tax on imported British goods. Now, when the British left, the Spanish came with the gunboat too. We want something like the British. Now, when the Spanish left, the Dutch came. We want something like the British and the Spanish. And the first one would be the French. And after that, I don't remember. But in total, we include 15 treaties like that. Mm -hmm. What it means, just like Professor Ajahn Andrew mentioned, it's not uniform. It's not uniform. Mm -hmm. So we want something uniform. That's why we create the so-called MFN principle, no discriminatory on you know, the tariff. Now, that is from legal perspective. But from economic perspective, what it means is of course, the FTA is good for the party, but it is bad for the non-member. Even though the barrier, the barrier stay the same, but they suffer. Now, let me give you the good example. 
Thailand have to negotiate on substantial item on our tariff books because of the rule. Actually, what Thailand want to get from the Japanese is the Thai negotiator know is cow man kai sai nam tan. We want rice, we want tapioca, we want chuka, and we want chicken meat. At the same time, the Japanese want from us, they only need three items. First one is the car with more than 2,000 cc, because Lexus want to export their car and compete with European car. And the second one is the very high-tech, advanced, highly value-added engine and part. And the next one would be high-quality steel, because a lot of Japanese automobile here. But we cannot say, let's trade like that, because you know, you're going to cheat at the trading partner. That's why under the rule, you have to negotiate substantially, which means that 90% of the tariff uh, item that we have in our hands. For the Japanese, it would mean 10,000. For the Thai, it would mean 5,000, because we have about 5,500 items. Mm -hmm. Now, the trade diversion I meant is, when the Japanese agreed to Thailand that we're going to reduce tally blade for chicken meat from you, from 11.9% to 8.5%. Of course, the Japanese trading house in Thailand, they will import more. You got to remember that we cannot export chicken meat to Japan directly. We have to export it via the Japanese trading house. Because Japanese trading house are in control of international trade, more than 50% of international trade. Now, it does not mean that Japanese eat more chicken meat, but because import chicken meat from Thailand, it would be cheaper because they pay only 8.5%. Now, the one who suffer would be Thailand's competitor, China and Brazil, because they would export less chicken meat to the Japanese market. That is trade diversion. So for China, if you want to get more access to the Japanese market, you need to negotiate FTA with Japan. That is the trade diversion. Mm -hmm. That is from economic perspective. But as you mentioned, you know, when you negotiate bilaterally, it will create also a spaghetti effect. Because if you ne Japanese negotiate with Thailand, we're going to reduce Thailand for your textile from 40% to 5%, for the Philippines to 8%, for Indonesia to 10%. Now, when the church come from Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand, the custom administrator, they, they have to look. which saw they come from. Mm -hmm. So that would also one of the, the, the head a problem. Uh, Professor Sagna, maybe you could compare Thailand's policy with Japan's one. How, how can Japan protect their agriculture business? <laughs> um, I know it's, it's kind of out of um, the perspective, but I think it, it worth mentioned because Japan is also the leading country in TPP, right? Yes. If they join, how can they protect themselves? Actually, the thing is, they cannot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They cannot. Okay. They'll have to. They have to. Yield, yes. And in the United States, this is one of the primary reasons why a lot of people are rejecting the TPP, is because in difficult economic times, the urge to protectionism always comes back. And People are not so interested in further liberalization if it, in fact, endangers some of their favorite industries. Uh, if they can no longer, in fact, protect themselves, then they're more vulnerable to the economic forces. And the U.S. sees itself at the moment, rightly or wrongly. Uh, most U.S. economists say, well, the U.S. economy is actually doing better than just about anywhere in the world. And if we sign on to open up further to all these other markets, aren't we just infecting ourselves with the same market mm -hmm. malaise that they're suffering from? Mm. So there's an, a protectionist instinct that kicks in mm. in hard economic times. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a lot of what's driving the opposition. That it's just, uh, without necessarily reasoning it all out and doing a actual cost-benefit analysis, mm -hmm. people's gut feeling is, in hard times, we just need to take care of ourselves. And mm -hmm. we'd be better off just making sure that we make what we're good at making and selling it for a price that we want and pay not, no attention to what's going on somewhere mm. else. Okay, um, let's go to something more localized. Mm, if we go further, suppose we go further into the TPP or many, many ASEAN free trade agreement, 
are there any laws, any Thai laws or US law that we need to change in order to, uh, to convey to convey to the RCN F3A or TPP? Uh, let's start with Professor Andrew. I'll let you go first. Oh, okay, oh, I can okay. go first. Well, for Thailand, yes, we have many laws that we have to change uh, in order to comply with the TCC. Uh, First of all, one of our law that I think that would be very, uh, that we need to change, it would be Foreign Business Act. พระราชบัญญัติประกอบธุรกิจของคนต่างด้าวนะครับ. Uh, and also we need to change, uh, when we talk about trade in service, some of you may not know, it's not like good. For example, iPhone, they export iPhone to Thailand. It, you know, it is visible, we can touch it. But for the service, the most of deliver the service will be four mode, you know, uh, trans, uh, cross border. For example, if the Thai trim got, you know, problem with the, new, the United States Minister of Commerce, Department of Commerce, we need to hire lawyer in DC. They would give advice. We have uh, internet, but we have to pay them. That would be the first one. The second one would be we go abroad to receive the service, just like. Uh, Many of us, like Ajahn Papuk, go to Cornell and receive education there. He have to pay uh, tuition there. The more three, second one will be commercial presence, like the AIA come to Thailand, set up the company, have the land and the, the office in Bangkok. This one is under more three, uh, and it is regulated by the Thai Thailand Business Act. And the next one, when the AIA want to send their executive to come to Thailand, normally they have to send to their CEO here. Then they have to apply for work permit under the so-called Parachamayat Gan Thamgan Nukhon Tang Dao, Foreign uh, Working uh, Act. Those are the two major law that uh, we need to change. And also, uh, when we talk about free trade earlier, we are talking about logistics. Because the good like Toyota produce in Indonesia, uh, Innova, that my sister is driving, it came from Indonesia. It cannot, you know, fly to Thailand. So they have to be mode of transportation, sea or land or airplane. So those are, 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 are important. And of course, there will be a lot of infrastructure need to be built. Okay. Now, Many companies, they want to come to Thailand, and they want to do logistic job, distribution, etc. But the Thai law, for example, พรบคนส่งทางบก, พรบคนส่งทางน้ำ, we are against foreigners. We don't provide them, you know, the national treatment. We need to change that. That is one of the uh, kind of like the law that we need to change. But on the positive side, because we try to have more skilled labor moving around in this region. Like the Thai architect, Satapan, who graduated from uh, Thai University, many of them go to Singapore and work there. And some engineer who graduated from faculty of engineer in Thai University, they go to Singapore and work there because salary is higher. However, for some professional like medical doctor or nurse or dentist, it's more complicated than that because it would touch upon human's life and health. Uh, for example, we need the so-called mutual recognition agreement. The first step they have to do is the Thai Medical Doctor Association, Pataya they need to go to the Philippines and look at the curriculum of the medical school in the Philippines. And first of all, they would recognize that only the curriculum and that university. And after that, they would move up to another level mean that if they graduate from that university with that curriculum, they can take the, the medical exam in Thailand. And if they pass, then it would be the step they can, they can practice medicine in Thailand. So it would be a long step to do that. So far, we have not achieved yet. Okay. So far, we have not achieved yet. What concretely we need to achieve is probably the medical exam need to be changed into English. <laughs> Okay, that is the, the, the first step. So a long way to go. Yeah. I would say that on behalf of 
what United, law, United States laws might need to be changed, it would be less in the sense that the United States was one of the primary drivers of the negotiation and a lot of the targeting is to force other trading partners within TPP to change their laws to look more like United States laws. So the U.S. has less to do in terms of changing its own laws to comply with the requirements of the TPP since the part of the strategy was to force others to conform. So this is the U.S. way. Yes. <laughs> Strong arm of the law, as they say. Strong arm into changing their own laws. But that's not to say there's no work required because, in fact, if you look at intellectual property law, uh, there are provisions in the TPP that go beyond current intellectual property law in the United States that would require modifications. For example, uh, the current copyright in the United States is the lifetime of the author plus 50 years, but TPP calls for lifetime plus 70 years. So additional extension, 20 more years of guaranteed copyright protection. So the U.S. laws would have to change to reflect that. Um, there is much tougher restrictions on the fair use doctrine. The fair use doctrine is not a statutory law in the United States. It's created by judge-made law, by decisions of courts that allow for use of copyrighted materials for educational purposes, for public commentary, for satire and humor. You can take a movie and make a whole spoof of it mm. without having to pay one penny to the movie studio that released the original because making fun of something is fair use. Mm. And there are significant restrictions. It's called parody, right? Parody, yes. Parody. And satire. Um, there are significant restrictions. I don't know all the text, but I have heard it said that the U.S. would be surprised because they're mm. aiming it at other countries. It was motivated, believe, if you believe the stories, that the Hollywood movie studios were the driving mm. lobbying force. The motion picture uh, industry of America was responsible for putting these provisions into the TPP and that it would actually require US law to change as well. Mm. Uh, at the moment, academics are free to show movies in the classroom mm -hmm. and to comment on them. They can read copyrighted works in class for discussion, and suddenly universities might have to start paying royalty fees for mm. that exact same use mm. that currently is not required. Okay, so it's also, um, oh, even oh, though, sorry. okay. One more. It's not specific because I, those were two actual provisions of law that I know would have to change to comply with TPP, but a lot of the opposition you could call it a scare campaign, but there is some reason to be scared. A lot of the opposition has said, we don't really know what's going to change because of the ISDS provisions, the provisions that are designed to guarantee corporate investment will be protected, that this might in fact force change in domestic laws, change in legislation, because if the company is saying, look, your environmental restrictions mean that I cannot operate my business profitably, the country is more likely to change their laws than they are to try and pay compensation because they don't have money to pay for all the lo supposed lost profits that would result from the environmental restrictions. So there is concern that it would force the hand. And indeed, the one argument made against it is it would somewhat weaken the sovereignty of the signatory parties. They wouldn't have true sovereignty over their own laws because every time they acted, they'd be at risk of exposing themselves to corporate liability. Mm. So the effects mm. of corporate regulation, environmental regulation mm. and so on, might be so prohibitively expensive under the TPP mm. that governments would not enact those laws or repeal ones that mm. already exist. Okay, thanks to Ajahn Sakda and Ajahn Andrew, we just visited, we just landing at Narita Airport and then transfer to JFK Airport. <laughs> but right now it's time to go back to Suwannapum Airport. <laughs> okay, so are there any questions? Because this is a Q&A session. Are there any questions? Please do not hesitate to raise your hand. I, I, don't, okay. have a, I don't have a question, but I just had one nice little factoid that I didn't get a chance to, to use. And I wanted to throw it out there just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about and what Ajahn Tanet is talking about when he says, proliferation, you could call it explosion mm. of free trade agreements, because I mentioned that the uh, Doha 
agenda had called for the WTO to try and do something about this, which has met with failure. Like much of the Doha agenda, it's sort of gone off the rails and no progress has occurred. However, one thing that did come out of it was in 2006, they adopted a notification procedure at the WTO. So any new free trade agreements or any modifications to existing free trade agreements must be notified to all WTO members by the signatory parties or the negotiating parties involved. And since that provision has taken effect, the WTO has received notice of 625 regional trade agreements that are either under negotiation or have been signed. So of that 625, 419 have already taken effect and are in force. So that is an enormous number. We only talk about the big ones that we all hear about every day, about the AFTA and NAFTA and TPP, but there are in fact hundreds, quite literally hundreds of these things in circulation. Okay, thanks Ajay Andrew for the for a little delay of our plan. Okay, the question can be asserted in Thai or English and we will uh, interpret to the panelists. Okay. My first question for Ajahn Sakda. Uh, what are the main difference for Thailand to enter TPP agreement that uh, the already exit term that Thailand has already made in Asian trade agreement? Uh, what are the main difference for Thailand to enter TPP agreement and the already existing term that Thailand has already made in Asian trade agreement. I see. Why Thailand thinking of joining TPP, right? Yes. Different terms in TPP that make Thailand interested compared to the agreements they already have. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, now. Actually, we have the so-called, and now we, we have already the AEC, right? the AEC among our 10 member states. We also move up into the so-called RCEP, Regional Economic uh, Partnership Cooperation, which means we're going to include the East Asia, China, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India. We are moving in that direction. That's why many Thai economists, many Thai economists argue that we should not join TCC, TPP. We should join RECP, RCEP, mm -hmm. okay. What they call ASEAN plus six, right? ASEAN plus six, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but they call it the RCEP, uh, they, they, they're standing for the, the ASEAN plus six. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, the one who said Thailand should not join TPP because it's under the American leadership. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you should not trust American that much. <laughs> I'm not an American leader, so you don't have to blame me. <laughs> Now, the one who said that would be Dr. Supachai, the former uh, director general of the WTO, that carry a lot of weight. Plus the Thai TDRI, the think tank, Dr. Dan Ben mentioned about that. But at the same time, if you look at the Thai private sector, they say we cannot wait. Remember one of the major export of Thai goods that we export is textile and garment. Textile, we are talking about fabric, and garment is our main export. The top five, the biggest Thai textile garment, they did not wait for the, whether or not the government would join TPP or not, because they think it's bad. What I'm saying here is the pressure on the government that you better join it now. Because the private sector, especially the labor incentive, the top five textile garment companies, they only moved to Vietnam. And they say, if you, if you don't join, we're going to expand mean that the job would move from Thailand to Vietnam because we're going to leave Thailand. Because if we produce in Vietnam, we will have the rule of origin in Vietnam. We can export to the US, plus the fact that we mentioned about the EU, Thailand, FTA, because you are very slow in negotiating with the EU, but Vietnam are very fast. So if I produce my textile and garment, actually for a very big American uh, sport company, Nike, Adidas, we can export both to the U.S. market, and our product is made in Vietnam. We're going to get, you know, the tariff uh, preference, and also we can export to the EU. 
now that is the move from the Thai private sector, including the Thai industry, uh, the, the so-called the giant of industry and estate, Nikom Mufakam, Kun Vikom. Kun Vikom mentioned that we're going to, to make more industry and estate in Vietnam. Why? Because if we go there, many companies would move into our industry and estate because they can export to the U.S. because Vietnam is signatory to the TPP and also export to the EU. So it put a lot of pressure on the Thai government. That is what happened. Um, any questions? Okay, please. This is also a question to Ajahn Sakda to, to follow on what you have just said. Um, because I have quite a limited knowledge with regards to this area of law, but I was wondering whether are there any threats or challenges that we have to be mindful before entering in any kind of uh, 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 an, a regional trade agreement because from what I understand is that we will get quite a lot of benefits from joining but isn't that would require perhaps maybe big business to, to have that capacity to do that kind of transactions what about the small business would they die off are there any legal buffer that we need to be mindful or careful about Actually, uh, when you talk about the economic theory, because uh, free trade, multilateral trading system is good for the countries as the whole. But of course, if you have free trade, it would mean that if you are a very competitive company, you survive and you, uh, you prosper. But if you are, not less, you, you are not competitive, you are going to die. Now, in order to save or to help those who cannot compete, who become the loser, the Americans started the program called Trade Adjustment Act in 1962 under Kennedy administration. For those companies who cannot compete, they would seek help from the government, basically it's financial help. Thailand also set up some fund to help the loser, but it's not very effective. They spend only one billion baht, one thousand baht, to help. Them. So we know that people, some small company die because they don't know there's the fund there. And even though there's fund there, they are not qualified to get the fund. But remember, multilateral trading system is good for the country as the whole. But if you are the company with this different level and you cannot you are not competitive. That is the rule of the game. Okay. Uh, Ajay Andrew, would you like to mention more about uh, the U.S. regime to help small business? Uh, only to say that it has fallen well short of the target. Uh, as proposed, you know, what Ajahn Sakta was just discussing is, of course, the overall argument in favor of trade in general and free trade agreements in particular is that overall they produce economic benefit and so it's good for growing the economy it leads to further economic development and growth which in theory should be a broad spread uh, benefit for all if you live in the country and the economy is growing isn't that good for you this is a question of distribution <laughs> and the problem where some of the free trade uh, proponents haven't really addressed the real world problems is that the distribution is in fact not even. It is not across the board that the benefits of trade largely accrue to large multinational corporations or large domestic corporations that engage in a significant amount of international trade. They benefit enormously. But there's a lot of economic dislocation. Smaller businesses who don't do much trade, see no benefit at all, but they're forced to compete with a suddenly much broader range of outside competition. Foreign companies they never had to deal with before are suddenly in their home market competing in the same stores that they're in. And what has largely been underdone is trying to accommodate those who don't directly benefit 
So that the benefits of trade are more widely distributed. People, certainly in America, since John asked me about the American perspective, the political feeling in the U.S. has always been against wealth distribution. They don't support the idea that we need to help everyone. Mm. It's not a welfare state in the classic sense of some of the Eastern, mm. I mean, the Western mm. European countries. And so it's a sink or swim culture where you're expected to rise or fall on your own through your own merits. And so the government has done very little to help those that have been harmed by free trade mm. agreements, mm. by opening up markets to intense mm. competition. Mm. Those who have lost their jobs have received nothing. There have been no real training programs, no re-education, no government programs to offer new employment opportunities to those who have lost their work as a result of manufacturing being overseed, sent offshore. So yes, a program was created back during the Great Society era in America, the one real stab that American politicians made at improving welfare in the United States. But since the 1980s, the trend has been very strongly in the other direction, mm. away from social welfare. Mm. And so very little, in fact, has been spent and very little has been done to help mm. the losers, as you mm. said. The, the, there's winners and losers in every deal, mm. and there's been not very much done in the United States mm. to try and balance out winners and losers. And this is one of the reasons why they find now there's very little public support. Recent polling shows that the numbers of average citizens who say they support the TPP is under 40 percent. Okay, Ajahn Sakda looks like you have to, yes. Uh, sorry uh, Ajahn Andrew, but no uh, we need to finish soon. But before yes. we finish, um, Professor Sakda would like to ask may, something. May I, you know, it's almost very late, but I think it's very important. Uh, Thailand, I think the problem we are stuck in now is the so-called middle income traps, meaning that if you keep producing rice, sugar, you, you go nowhere. And Thailand has become an aging society, meaning that people like myself in the few years are going to retire. And I would have income, the pension, but you have to pay for me. Mm -hmm. Now, that is going to be the big problem for the government. Now, in order to get out of the so-called middle income, uh, there are many ways. One of the ways is that, just like uh, Ajahn mentioned, asked me, how's about the Thai SME? What should we try to do? I think we should try to take advantage of the so-called single production base. What it means is I don't encourage the Thai to produce car, automobile, compete with the Japanese. That would be too difficult. No way. Uh, we have to remember one thing. When the Japanese take advantage of the AEC, they did it. You know, they know the AEC from, you know, on what on expect. This would be the book that I just picked it up from Osaka. It talks about the group that come in Southeast Asia. So when the Japanese come, they know exactly, like in Thailand, what kind of business group that are very big, successful, that they want to join with. So, for example, in the, Thai, uh, in the automobile, we have to look at the automobile as very expensive, uh, very important. The Japanese automobile, each year they would produce two million cars. Two million cars. And about 7.5 uh, uh, 7.5, not million, uh, se uh, 705,000 cars are sold domestically. But more than half, 60% are export. So more than one, one million car are export overseas. They earn a lot of money into Thailand. For motorcycle, Honda motorcycle alone produce more than 1.5 million motorcycle per year. And each one would cost about 50,000 baht, right? 5,000. Huh? We are talking about 500,000 million baht, 500,000 baht. And the Thai GDP is 13 uh, trillion, 13 million, 13 so only automobile and motorcycle would compose about 20% of the Thai GDP. And they hire uh, worker about 1.7. Now, what I'm talking now here is when Toyota or Honda come, they would have part producer. They would have the first year producer. So if you buy Toyota car, the major part are made by Nippon Denso or Toyota Boshoku. They won't buy from other one. Now, for the Thai company, we have the largest Thai work, uh, part maker, that is Thai Summit. 
with 3,000 workers. What Thai Summit try to do and another part maker try to do is try to upgrade their product and get integrated into the production network. Of course, you can try to produce a car and compete with Toyota, but that is not realistic. The first step, if, if the Thai move up and get integrated into the production network, it would be a win-win situation for both. Okay. I think that is the way we can get our middle income trap. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sakdai and Professor Andrew. I hope this panel will enlighten you something and make your academic work uh, becomes more perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Sawadee kap. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for both the panelists and our moderator today. I believe we have gained quite a very informative and very interesting, maybe perhaps a PhD topics for all of us here. Um, now I would like Ajahn Banjir Nakha to <laughs> present uh, a souvenir as our token of appreciation to our panelists, Ajahn Sakda and Andrew, and also Ajahn Baprit as well, huh?